Now you see him, now you don't. That's not really something scary. I feel like it's more what a magician says, but uh, it's Goosebumps number six, Let's Get Invisible. Grab your books, everybody, and let's get Goosebumps. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's Rhino here and welcome back to Let's Get Goosebumps. This is the series where myself and anybody out there who would like to join me are attempting to read all 62 of the original R.L. Stein Goosebumps books. Uh, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of this belovedly spooky franchise and it's been a blast so far. I'm confident that we're going to be able to do it. I know that I am a little behind right now. I technically should be posting like book seven, which is Night of the Living Dummy by now, but I, uh, I've i just been kind of busy with work and some other stuff, so um, I am confident that we are going to be able to catch up. So with that said, my advice would be to subscribe to the channel or the audio uh, podcast feed just to be able to kind of I, I'm not releasing these on a consistent schedule. It's just kind of like as soon as I read them, I can put them out there. And that way, if you are reading along at home, you'll have them to watch and listen to whenever whenever you catch up or, or uh, if you're way ahead of me, which I'm sure some of you are, that way you uh, can bookmark the episode or anything like that. We're here to talk about Let's Get Invisible. This is Goosebumps number six. Uh, and this one was published in March of 1993. It is 139 pages and is actually, I guess, the longest book in the original series. So we did it. We read the longest one. Good work, everybody. The cover art, again, is by uh, Tim Jacobus. And apparently, in the original printing of this book, or uh, the original artwork, um, so like in the original printing, like the classic cover, there's these cobwebs on the mirror. And in the original artwork, that isn't there. So, like, when they reprinted this cover, the artwork, uh, or the artwork, the um, spider web doesn't show up, which is weird. They, I, I saw that on the Goosebumps wiki. It was just saying that um, they were added by, like, some random employee, they think. So, that, but again, like I said, they were removed in the uh, later reprints. But I read the tag at the beginning of the, the top of the show here. Now you see him, now you don't. Um... And I'm going to read the back of the book here. Disappearances can be deadly. God, that's scarier than anything that happened in the book. On Max's birthday, he finds a sort of magic mirror in the attic. It can make him become invisible. So Max and his friends start playing. Now you see me, now you don't. Until Max realizes he's losing control. Staying invisible a little too long. Having a harder and harder time coming back. Getting invisible is turning into a very dangerous game. The next time Max gets invisible, will it be forever? Reader beware, you're in for a scare. Um, I guess in like 2010, R.L. Stein said on Twitter that he always liked this book and it's actually inspired by the movie Flatliners. And now that I've read the back of the book, that is 100% true. Because I mean, you can read the book and tell, but that is kind of, the back of this book could pretty much literally be the sum of the Flatliners movie, which if you don't remember, that was like Keith for Sutherland and they're like the doctors and they basically keep like killing themselves for X amount of time to be able to come back and then they start seeing things. They did like a, I think a remake and maybe Elliot Page was in it. I'm not sure. I feel like I'm remembering that. I could be wrong though. So, um, but anyway, let's, let's dive into, let's dive into the book now. So I, yeah, right away, this book starts the way like the last one did with a like a tease of sort of like the the terror that's to come if you will it's um uh i went invisible for the first time on my 12th birthday it was all whitey's fault in a way whitey is my dog he's just a mutt part terrier part everything else he's all black so of course we named him whitey if whitey hadn't been sniffing around in the attic well maybe i'd better back up a bit and start at the beginning so it does that thing where it's like he's telling us the story um, but our main character here is Max Thompson, and he is having his birthday party at home. Uh, among the guests are Noah Lefty Thompson, who is the annoying brother, absolutely annoying, atrocious character. Then we have Zach, Aaron, and April. Those are all uh, his friends. It's important to note, though, um, right here that Noah's name 
he goes by lefty specifically because he's like the only one that's left-handed in the family and that comes up later so that's important zach is max's best friend uh, who has what sounds like uh an incredible 90s haircut where it's like that thing where it's like shaved on one side of the head but like long hair on the other one other side so then we have aaron who is a uh kind of a, a, a brazen loud uh, loud uh, outspoken girl and uh april who is much more timid and shy and uh, i just i do want to make a note too um that could literally mean nothing here this is so early on in the book it's between pages five and six and um it is like it, it, so april shows up um and she gives Max his like gift and it's gift wrap in Christmas paper. And he's like, Merry Christmas to you too. And the only reason I want to point that out is because they said that literal same joke in the last book. So like, you know, in Star Wars where they always say, uh, I have a bad feeling about this. That's what I feel like I wanted to point it out just in case, and just in case Merry Christmas to you too becomes like the Goosebumps tagline. Anyway, so so anyway, they're there for the party. The party's dying down. These kids go upstairs uh, and I am going to read this incredibly uh, dated sentence that is here on the top of page eight. Let's go to my room, I suggested when I finally got the dumb dog quiet. What is with them and the dog again? I got a new Super Nintendo game I want to try. Aaron and April gladly followed me upstairs. They didn't like the Terminator movie for some reason. I just thought that was, uh, I think it's funny because like Super Nintendo Terminator movie. Although here's the thing. If you ever come over and hang out here, I've got all the Nintendos like lined up in front of my TV. And I often do play Super Nintendo still to this day because what's better than like Donkey Kong? Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, I, I I love the those kind of references because it's always like, God, this kid would have been so cool in the day. Um, so, and again, I don't know what is the hate with the dog here that keeps coming up. So these kids are just awful to their pets. Anyway, so the the thing is, is like, uh, they, they, for some reason, so they're up like stairs. They're trying to figure out what to do. Whitey's, remember, the dog is sitting at the attic door. And Aaron, for some reason, loves attics, you know? I don't, I mean... Whatever. There's cool stuff in Annex, I guess. Max is like, um, there's a bunch of stuff up there. My grandparents left it because they used to, the house they're living in used to be the grandparents' house. They go up, they snoop around. The dog finds this like crazy hidden room in like the middle of the attic. And uh, inside that is uh, like a large old mirror that has one of those lights across the top of it um, with one of those like dangly chains. Um, so what's interesting about the book too, I already said this again, is like, this is the part where I was really feeling like the story that is happening here is being told to us by the main character. So it, it feels very much like, uh, we're sitting around listening to what happened from them. Um, so I'm going to read just really quickly here, the very bottom of, uh, page 12 uh, Whitey, I called, stepping around an old dining room table. I made my way across the cluttered attic. I quickly saw that he was scratching at the bottom of a door. Hey, look, I called to the others. Whitey found a hidden door. Cool, Aaron cried, hurrying over. Lefty and April were right behind. I didn't know this was up here, I said. We've got to check it out, Aaron urged. Let's see what's on the other side. And that's when the trouble all began. You can understand why I say it was all Whitey's fault, right? If that dumb dog hadn't started sniffing and scratching there, we might never have found the hidden attic room. And we never would have discovered the exciting and frightening secret behind that wooden door. Yeah, so it's very like, I feel like very campfire-y story. Almost Are You Afraid of the Dark-esque. Uh, which is also, I love that. So, um, so they, 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 you know, open the door, they find the mirror, Max pulls the chain and poof, disappears. The lights go out, Max reappears. Everyone insists that he went invisible, even though he thinks it was a joke. But right when he goes to like do it again, they get called, um, out of the attic before they can, you know, prove it to him. Uh, that night Max returns to the attic to inspect the mirror. And the way he like kind of talks about it at this point in the book, it kind of reminded me of, um... He, like he says he's like very drawn to it and it reminded me of in the lord of the rings uh, where anybody who like kind of wears the ring like well i guess it would be like frodo who really wears the ring i mean um bilbo had it first and stuff like that but it you know how that ring made them go invisible and then like essentially once they once they use it i feel like they're like drawn back to it and there's like this pull to them um so it kind of it kind of felt like there was an illusion to that sort of thing 
Um, so I wonder if that had any basis in it or not. But uh, I'm going to read this little part here. It's on page 28. It's just right in the middle of the page uh, if you're following along here. But then my eyes stopped at the doorway to the small hidden room. In our hurry to leave, we had left the door wide open, staring at the darkness beyond the open doorway. I stepped onto the landing and made my way quick, quickly across the cluttered floor. The floorboards creaked and groaned beneath me, but I barely heard them. I was drawn to the open doorway, drawn to the mysterious room as if being pulled by a powerful magnet. I had to see the tall mirror again. I had to examine it, study it closely. I had to know the truth about it. I stepped into the small room without hesitating and walked up to the mirror. I paused for a moment and studied my shadowy reflection in the glass. My hair was totally messed up, but I didn't care. I stared at myself, stared into my eyes. Then I took a step back to get a different view, and the mirror reflected my entire body from head to foot. There wasn't anything special about the reflection. It wasn't distorted or weird in any way. The fact that it was such a normal reflection helped to calm me. I hadn't realized it, but my heart was fluttering like a nervous blood butterfly. My hands and feet were cold as ice. Chill out, Max, I whispered to myself, watching myself whisper in the dark mirror. I did a funny little dance for my own benefit, waving my hands above my head and shaking my whole body. Nothing special about this mirror, I said out loud. I reached out and touched it. The glass felt cold despite the warmth of the room. I ran my hand along the glass until I reached the frame. Then I let my hand wander up and down the wood frame. It also felt smooth and cold. It's just a mirror, I thought, finally feeling more relaxed. Just an old mirror that someone stored up here long ago and forgot about. I also, like... I is, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'm going to jump ahead by accident. So anyway, at this point, Lefty has followed Max up to the attic and they decide they're both going to make themselves invisible. Um, after 10 minutes or so, they begin to feel really weak. They turn off the light. But this time, uh, it just takes a little bit longer for them to become uh, visible again. Uh, the next day, the group from the party reassembles at Max's house. Aaron suggests that they hold a contest to see who can be invisible the longest. April having no part of, uh, she's just like, nope, 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 I'm not playing. No part of this. Um, she chooses to uh, be the official timer for everybody. Um, so before Lefty gets a chance to go invisible, his grandparents actually arrive for dinner, who for some reason, I assume, had passed away because they said they were living in this house that used to belong to their grandparents. But I guess the grandparents could have just like retired and moved or something. Um, but also, I thought at some point he was going to bring up the mirror to them, and that never happens at all. So, um, so I don't I don't know. Maybe they're the grandparents on the other side, and that's just kind of left out of the book, you know, like on the dad's side versus the mom's side or something. I don't know. Anyway, the kids decide to postpone their contest until another day. During dinner, Lefty gets up and he leaves the table, and a while later, Max sees some floating fork and figured out that Lefty has made himself invisible. Classic hijinks ensue. Uh, he runs up to the attic to bring Lefty back, and it takes a long time this time. Lefty is like, it was awesome, I didn't feel weird at all, and I'm the new champ. So he's a, very gloaty. And uh, that night, uh, Aaron calls Max and tells him he should take the mirror to school for a science fair, weirdo, but he refuses. Max goes to the attic again, and he looks at his reflection in the mirror. He starts to hear his name being whispered from the mirror, but he thinks he's imagining it. He runs back to his bedroom. The next morning when Max wakes up, he finds out that his brother is invisible yet again. So his like clothes are kind of flying around the room and he's doing weird stuff. And as Lefty is sort of parading the, uh, the clothes around, uh, bed knobs and broomstick style here with Max's like pants, the clothes just all of a sudden like drop to the floor and Lefty goes silent. So here we're thinking this is just another one of... Uh, Lefty's annoying fake outs because this would probably be like the third or the fourth time in this book that this kid has just been like either silent and tried to fake somebody out or like popped out somewhere and you know it's been the, the last section of a chapter like the cheap scare or anything like that and so uh Max runs up to the attic after a minute though and he sees the mirror still on obviously and Lefty finally answers him up there he turns the light off Lefty reappears and Max says he looks a little different but he can't put his finger on it so Max, uh, Max decides to call the friends and, and call off this big Go Invisible competition like they had planned for Wednesday. Uh, it gets to Wednesday, though, and the friends still show up. They're saying that Lefty called them and said that the competition was back on. Also, this is the part in the book where they uh, say the title. They say, Let's Get Invisible. I was, like, reading it. This is, like, page 102 at this point, and um, it was just one of those where I was like, Ooh, that's the title. 
Upstairs, Zack cried, eagerly pointing to the stairs. Let's get invisible, Aaron whispered. I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I'm weird. I like when stuff like that happens. Uh, so also at this point in the book, we are at chapter 18. Okay, like page 102, a little further than that. And the parents have asked about the attic. I don't know. I don't know how many times at this point. But like, at what point do you go up into the attic to make stair and make sure like the kids aren't doing drugs or anything like that? I mean, they're like 13 years old, right? They're in that age frame, I guess. Maybe Eleven's a little younger. I don't know. Um, I mean, I was always a good kid. But I was definitely wandering around in, like, things I shouldn't be. And uh, But I was pretty straight edge in terms of that stuff. But, I mean, this book is, to me, very clearly about what happens with peer pressure, though. Because Max is just a terrible protagonist who just can't... Antagonist? Protagonist. Protagonist who just can never commit to being like, we're not using this mirror. We're not doing this anymore. Um, but anyway, they're, they're up in the attic. April decides she's going to go invisible this time, but the dog jumps in and Max panics and makes her become visible again. So she's only invisible for like a second. Uh, Erin goes invisible for several minutes. She starts acting weird when she comes back. Uh, Zach, um, I'm sorry, I left my messages on. Excuse me. I apologize for that little ding there. Uh, Zach goes and stays invisible for 15 minutes. When he comes back, his hair is different. Remember that shaved haircut on one side of the head? Um, when Max asks him about his hair, Aaron and Zach use the mirror to make him invisible. They force him invisible. As the minutes roll by, Max begins to feel weak. He asks to be made visible again, but Zach and Aaron don't pay attention to him. A haze starts to appear, followed by this like white light and a figure approaching Max, which is his own reflection. Max's reflection tells him that Zach and Aaron have been replaced by their reflections. Zach and Aaron are now locked in the mirror, and before Max's reflection can swap places with him, the duplicates of Aaron and Zach make Max visible again, assuming that they uh, that the bo- that Ma- evil Max and regular Max have already been swapped out. So uh, suddenly, Max's reflection appears in the mirror. He tells them that the real Max has escaped. The duplicates of Aaron and Zach try to make Max invisible again. Max flees the attic, but he's caught uh, by the reflection. He asks April for help, but she's she also gets caught. Um, and at this point, we have like two pages left in the book and I'm like what's going on here so this is the moment when lefty shows up in the attic and that uh, softball that he's always carrying around and throwing around and uh, he goes to throw it to what I what I assume he believes was actually max and he hits the mirror instead and uh, the reflections are all sucked back into the mirror pieces and the real Aaron and Zach are brought back into the real world. So to cool down from all the drama and the excitement, Max and Lefty decide to play catch, but to his horror, Max notices that Lefty is throwing with his right hand. Dun, dun, dun. That's it. That's the book. I know. Isn't it crazy? When it said it was the longest one and it was like, I just was like, there's like two pages. How is this going to wrap up so quickly? But overall, this one, even though when I was younger, I thought the idea of a mirror where you could like turn it on and and whatever and stuff was really cool. I felt like this one wasn't my favorite so far. Like I don't really like any of the characters, I think was the problem for me. I thought they were all very obnoxious. I did like the aspect of the story where the kids find the cursed object because I'm always a fan of that sort of stuff. Um, I like a good like attic grandparents attic or basement or uh, something dug up in a yard somewhere stuff like that but uh, I feel like a lot of this book had a lot of filler it was sort of a lot of um, like a lot of just the same thing over and over. I didn't mind it at first but it was about two-thirds of the way through the book where I was like "Eh, okay come on I basically thought Max was an idiot and I just didn't have the ability to stand up for himself and say what he really wanted like I said earlier I feel like it was very much like what peer pressure is, is. So it didn't really get like a good character moment for anybody either. There wasn't like he had a redeeming moment. He essentially only only survived this, not because he like learned a lesson, but because uh, his brother broke the mirror by accident. By accident. I don't know. Maybe it was an evil one. I don't know. Um, I didn't I didn't like hate the story or anything like that. I liked the idea. I remember thinking it was cool, like I said, but um, uh like, I, I thought having the light be the thing that switches it back and forth was actually really kind of interesting, too. Um, and something where it was, like, not 
plugged into really anything too so it made it like extra mysterious a little bit so and i do like how it ends on the twist with like oh the brother's there now i'm like is it a better brother because he's the like was the lefty the evil one all along um but um uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. what did i say Oh, yeah, because I, I wrote here that I said Max said that Lefty was evil, so really the only the, the one he's playing catch with at the end is potentially a better version of Lefty. Um, I mean, who hasn't looked at the mirror and imagined there's something on the other side? I used to do a thing like that with, like, a swimming pool because I think it, it came from um, uh, the Ewok, the first Ewok movie, The Caravan of Courage, where, like, Mace like touches the water and he gets like pulled into the water and then he can see everybody watching him like drown on the other side, but they're not really there. Um, so like I thought that aspect of like something that's reversed is always really cool. But um, I just kind of think it took a little too long to get to that part of the book. And then it was kind of resolved like that. So like, like I said, like a matter of a page and a half. Um, and they never talked to the grandparents. Like the grandparents were alive in the book and they never talked to them about it. Like what's going on? Where did the, ba did the grandparents have this experience go on? I don't, I don't know. There's just a little bit. So it was just, a, like, there was just little things like that. But, but I mean, like I, like I said, I didn't hate it. It just kind of, I felt like I was getting toward the end and it felt a little tedious at one point. But uh, there is a TV episode of this. It is season two, episode 13. Um, it's pretty true to the book, so I don't really have any notes on that. Um, they basically cut one of the friends out. Uh, I believe April is not a character. I could be incorrect in mixing April, or Aaron and Andy up, but... Um, also, the room they find the mirror in is insane, but it's it's still kind of... I actually really enjoyed the episode of the show because I feel like it made it a little more concise about what was going on. Uh, and the director of this episode made some choices. And I feel like it, it worked well, but there's such a weird, like... Um, like the mom, if I'm remembering this correctly, like the mom was a bicyclist or something like that all of a sudden. And the parents aren't like really in the book at all. I'm, I could be getting that mixed up with the... No, because there wasn't an episode of The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. Yeah. So it's just one of those sort of things where... Uh, I don't know. I, I Of the episodes of the shows we've watched, I actually think it was on the better side. It was also like the kid had got his ear pierced. That that was the switch. It wasn't the haircut. It was the ear pierced. And it was it's so... One of those things where I was like, God, this is so beautifully 90s and I love it. Um, so I, th I think it's worth, I think the episode's worth watching, uh, even if you skipped this this book or not. You'll get, like I said, it's pretty pretty spot on, almost like beat for beat about what happened. So, but the director or whoever made the episode took took some choices here and there that really, like they embraced it and I loved it. So, um, so I, yeah, I'm a fan. You know, the next book we have is a pretty signature Goosebumps book. It's Night of the Living Dummy. So... This is going to be a big one. Uh, I'm pretty excited here. We're going to meet Slappy, and uh, yeah, I don't. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta buckle down and start um, speeding up. But we have we have some great books on the horizon. The Haunted Mask is not far around the corner. I know that's a lot of people's favorites. I believe that is book eleven, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I'm just I'm enjoying this. I hope everybody out there is enjoying it. I want to thank you all for joining along with me. I know my energy level is a lot different at different times of these, and this one wasn't, wasn't my best, but I was a little thrown, and I needed to get it, get it out there. So, uh, thank you everybody for bearing with me and being a part of this. I, uh, please let me know your thoughts on Let's Get Invisible. I would love to chat about it in the comments of this, or you can get in touch with me on Twitter or Instagram or wherever. My, uh, social media channels are all Rhino, R-Y-N-O-1185, except if you want to watch my stuff on YouTube, it's youtube.com slash Ryan Clavin. And then, uh, of course, if you are listening to this on uh, iTunes or, or uh, if you're listening to it all and you want to rate, rate and review it, that's great. I guess that helps other people find it. I don't know. I'm not really, I'm just doing this for fun. But, you know, it's always fun to have more people in a group to chit-chat about this sort of stuff. So, um, so yeah. So, please, 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 please let me know. If you want to send me an email, let's get goosebumps. It's just the name of the podcast at gmail.com. There's no exclamation point in it. I don't know if you can put exclamation points in emails. But, um, yeah. So, please, uh, please reach out. I'd love to, love to chat and, uh, and just talk all things goosebumps and uh i hear the rumor right now is that there could potentially be a fear street 
house at Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Orlando this this year, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun if they do that. So I haven't watched the movies yet that are on Netflix, but I've I've heard good things. So I need to. I need to do that as well. So, well, thank you, everybody. And uh, I hope you're all doing well and staying safe, happy, and healthy. And I, I will see you next time. So take care. Bye.